Szechuan sauce, My Chemical Romance, Family Guy, sometimes things get discontinued and then people realize how awesome they are and they get brought back. Cars are no different. Today we're gonna look at 10 cars that died and were sent to hell, but then they came back. We're gonna decide if the newer versions live up to the original or if we should send them back to hell from whence they came. I'm James and this is the d d d d a big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people just like you. Last month I showed you a class by Jeff Finley about creating a perfect morning routine and I hope that it helped even some of you. In fact, I challenged you to better yourself and not just in a creative skill set. I'm talking about having a productive morning, understanding money management, and something I support, the benefits of living with plants. This month, I wanna show you guys Plants at Home by Christopher Griffin. In less than an hour, Christopher teaches you how to use plants as a tool for finding creativity and calm throughout the day. And as a fellow green thumb myself, I can totally relate to what Christopher's saying. And since Skillshare is all about education, there's no ads to interrupt your learning. They're constantly launching new premium classes so you can focus on accomplishing real growth. And the best part, Skillshare costs less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. That's like the same price as a large fast food meal. Click the link in the description to start your journey and the first thousand of you guys to click that link will get a free Skillshare premium trial membership. And now, back to the show. Acura NSX. You look at any kid from my generation's list of dream cars and I bet you $400 that the Acura slash Honda NSX is gonna be in there. And for good reason. The NSX was one of the coolest cars at a time when there were a ton of cool cars. It was so freaking good that Ayrton Senna drove one in loafers. It was the first mass produced supercar with an all aluminum mono chassis. It had a beautiful naturally aspirated three liter V6 and the it took cues from an F-16 fighter jet. And it had VTEC. Oh. So it was pretty upsetting when after almost 15 years of production, Honda said they were gonna stop making them and send the NSX straight to hell. You know, where all cars go when they die. But James, if the NSX was so good, why did they kill it and send it to hell? Sincerely, Nacho Man 69. Well, it was simply existing in a changing landscape of fierce supercars and not being able to keep up. The fastest available production version, the Type R, only made 290 horsepower, which at the end of its run just wasn't enough. But in 2016, Honda resurrected the NSX and toot toot! It doesn't really live up to the original. Originally, it was supposed to have a 10-cylinder engine, but that was scrapped for a twin Spinny Boy V6, plus three additional electric motors that make close to 600 horsepower when all said and done. And while it's not as bad as a lot of journalists have made it out to be, I don't think it's a spiritual successor to the original NSX, which is lightweight and simple. Honda tried to make it a luxury car, and that's fine, but then they should have named it something different. Is it an NSX? In my opinion, no. Should it go back to hell? No, it's fine. Uh, it can go to purgatory. If you thought that that was gonna be the only three-letter car on this list, you're dead wrong! This one is American, and Ayrton Senna probably never drove one. Who knows? That guy never tells me anything. Pontiac GTO. The Pontiac GTO is arguably one of the first, if not the first, muscle cars. I'm not trying to argue about that right now. That's not what we're here to do. Okay, so the story goes, golden boy, the chin himself, John DeLorean, took a Pontiac Tempest, which was considered a grandma car back then, and crammed Pontiac's biggest engine under the hood, the 389 cubic inch V8. That's 6.4 liters for my soda heads out there. The GTO caught on, and soon, every other car company was trying to stuff a huge engine into their own mid-size coupes, but the GTO remained the original hunky muscle car boyfriend up until GM decided to pull the plug in 1974. Most people will tell you that it's because Pong mania had just swept the nation and everyone forgot about cars, but my theory is that it was because of a little thing called the gas crisis. You won't find that in textbooks, so we'll never know. Meanwhile, the GTO stayed in hell for the next 30 years, breaking big chunks of rock for literally no reason at all. What are they doing with the rocks? Nobody knows. 
I imagine it to be a very frustrating situation. But in 2004, the GTO came back from hell, only this time, it had an Australian accent. Oh, Hi, mate, what you say, you got a didgeridoo? Just a rebadge told Monaro. This next-gen GTO was powered by an LS1 that sent all 350 Brumbies to the rear wheels, and it had a top speed of 180 miles per hour. Not bad! The only thing that kind of sucked <laughs> was that, uh, it looked like a mid-2000s Pontiac, which didn't quite capture the allure of the original GTO. It was discontinued a few short years later, and then Pontiac went to hell right after that. Personally, I think that if Pontiac made the new car look more like the old one, they would have had a lot more success, and I'm not a huge fan of the GTO. I'm not gonna send it back to hell, but I don't really want one either, so it too can stay in purgatory. Ford Bronco. The original Ford Bronco was a badass little fur fur that spanned five generations from 1965 to 1996. But by the late 90s, SUVs were becoming gigantic behemoths and the little old two-door Bronco wasn't selling as well as it had been. Plus, the whole OJ thing might have ruined things a little bit for the little prince and kicky horse. It went to hell and it was replaced by the expedition to better compete with the Yukon and the Suburban. And they also made the Escape, which, you know. Then in 2017, Ford announced that they were bringing back the Bronco after 20 years in hell. The newest Bronco debuted last year, but is it any good? Does it retain the spirit of the original Bronco? Well, most people that have driven one are saying, yeah, yeah, it does. It maintains the spirit of the original Bronco. You can take the doors off and the roof. It's great. It looks cool as hell and it comes in a bunch of different trim levels and has a goat mode, which if you know anything about me, you know that I love goats. LeBron James, Jay-Z, me, greatest of all times. I think this is one of the best reboots ever so the new Bronco is 100% staying on Earth. It is not going back to hell. Chevy Blazer. Hey dude, you blaze. What did you think I was talking about? <laughs> Another American manufacturer trying to cash in on an old marquee is Chevy. With their answer to the Bronco, everyone's favorite truck named after a sensible dinner jacket, the Blazer. It's a compact two-door fur by fur. It has the same amount of letters in its name as the Bronco and it debutted just a few years after the original Bronco did in 1969. None! It was an awesome little compact Froder. Some might say better than the Bronco, but around the turn of the 90s, GM was shifting to a new full-size truck platform, and with the shift, the Blazer was extinguished. It met the same fate as the Bronco because everything was getting bigger back then, and it went to hell. But last year, Chevy brought this road dog back from hell with updated everything. But instead of being a rugged fur by fur, like what Ford did with the Bronco, they made it a pretty average sort of unrecognizable crossover. And a lot of people on the internet got really mad. So normally I'd have to go ahead and send this thing straight back to hell. But then I saw this thing that Lingenfelter made. It makes 450 horsepower and it kind of looks like a baby Lamborghini Yunus. All for under $50,000. So it can stay. Volkswagen Scirocco. Here's a video uh, that someone I don't know took of me loving life in one of my favorite cars, my 1981 Volkswagen Scirocco. Somehow this video has almost 500,000 views. Now, although this little dub looks like a Golf, there's almost nothing in it that is identical to a Golf apart from the engine. It was designed by my guy, designer of the century, Giorgetto Giugiaro, as a replacement for the Carmen Ghia in 1974. And they actually made a Scirocco GTI before they made a Golf GTI, okay? So, so put some respect on his name, which to my best understanding means a hot dust laden wind from the desert. For two generations, this beautiful little squishy boy went zero to 60 
into our hearts and then topped out shortly thereafter. And in the 90s, they discontinued the Scirocco in favor of the more powerful Corrado, also a great car. From 1992 on, it sat in the seventh layer of hell feeling like it had to poop. But then every time it went to poop, no poop came out. It was just farts, but they still had to wipe a bunch and they had a rash. But then the little old Scirocco caught a break when Volkswagen announced that they'd be bringing it back in the mid 2000s. And by 2008, the newest Scirocco was rolling off the production lines at Volkswagen's Portugal plant. Just like before, it looked like a beautifully squished golf and offered the same engines as said golf. They even made a Scirocco R. Uh, a drool rag please, Max? Thank you. Unfortunately, all I can do is drool into this rag until 2033 when it's legal to import one of these into the States because we never got them here. So I will not be sending it back to hell until at least then. If you're wondering who gave me these powers, don't worry about it. It's I got it from a stone. Jeep Grand Wagoneer. In the 1960s, Jeep put a station wagon body on a light truck chassis and voila, the Wagoneer was born. The Wagoneer was super successful and was actually the longest running domestic produced vehicle on the same platform by 1991. My parents had one when I was a kid. It's a great, big car. So why the heck did they stop making it? Well, by the end of its production, it was powered by a 5.9 liter V8 that made a whopping 144 horsepower, which is not a lot of power in a ginormous wagon car. And that big old weak boy V8 only got 11 miles to the gallon. And by the early 90s, gas mileage was on everybody's mind, including car manufacturers. And after 29 years, the Wagoneer took its last drive down the river Styx and vanished forever into hell. Or so we thought. Jeep announced a new Grand Wagoneer last year with the first version being available this summer, 2021, the horniest summer on record. And as SUVs become ever more gigantic, powerful and luxurious, Jeep just couldn't help themselves. Just like in the 60s, they threw their hat in the ring, only this time, that hat costs $110,000. But this honker is a real truck. It's built on the Ram 1500 platform and boasts 10 inches of ground clearance. It's also got really cool 4x4 modes, thus maintaining the essence of a Jeep. I'd love to know more, but sadly, it's a Jeep thing, and they told me I just won't understand. Chevy Nova. The Chevrolet Nova is on the Mount Rushmore of classic muscle cars. The Mount Rushmore power, baby! Mount Rushmore power, baby! 1970, you could get the Nova with a 396 cubic inch V8 that put down almost 400 horsepower. But just like with the GTO and basically every other car of the era, it became an anemic little twerp and got all the fun juices squeezed out of it because of Pong. So at the end of the 70s, Chevy euthanized what was left of the poor little creature. And yes, it fell straight into hell. I don't make the rules. I play within them. All cars go to hell. But then a rift from said hell opened up and before it had time to close, this emerged. The 6th gen Chevy Nova, AKA a rebadged AE92 Corolla. I like Corollas. I have one that doesn't run in the other room. But this thing, this isn't a Corolla. This is sacrilege. An abomination from the devil himself. From 1985, three years after its debut, the Nova was killed once again. And now, it's right back where it belongs. There are some fates worse than hell. This is one of them. Ford Thunderbird. Over 40 years, in 11 generations, the Ford Thunderbird underwent a lot of different transformations. And by the end of its run, it resembled every other boring American coupe on the road. So, in 1997, Ford executed it on the spot. Hands behind its head fell into a ditch. 
But around the year 2000, every US manufacturer started rolling out retro futuristic models. Now this trend was started by the new Beetle and gave us cars like the Prowler, what's up Yuri, the PT Cruiser, or Max's favorite car, the Chevrolet Scissor. Now considering how boring a lot of people thought the 10th gen Thunderbird was, the new T-Bird was striking in comparison. It really kind of captured the essence of the 50s Thunderbirds. The only difference was that this time, the car was meant for old people. The suspension was soft and it didn't have a manual option until later. The redesigned T-Bird was only in production for three years before it went back to hell again because it just wasn't successful. And if American culture has taught me anything, if you're not successful, you go to hell. The Thunderbird was not a great example of the retro futurist reboot trend. But there's one company that pulled it off really well. Dodge Challenger and Charger. The 1960s and 70s saw some of the most iconic versions of these cars with gnarly V8s and amazing paint jobs. The coolest colors available this side of the Lamborghini machine. So needless to say, the bar was pretty high when Dodge decided to bring these guys back in the mid 2000s. But as we know, they are a huge hit and continue to sell like crazy. Show me someone who just enlisted in the military and I will show you a Dodge Charger or Challenger. The spirit of the original muscle car has been kept alive as Dodge continues to introduce bigger and more powerful engines. Should these cars go back to hell? Hell no. Which brings us on to one of the most anticipated reboots in automotive history. Toyota Supra. Over four generations, the Supra reflected the enthusiasm of an emerging car subculture that ate up anything and everything JDM. But as Japan's economy started tanking in the 90s and people in the US stopped buying sports cars, Toyota decided to stop making Supras after the Mark IV. Talk of bringing back the Supra started as early as 2007 with speculation that Toyota would use the 3.5 liter hybrid V6 they developed for the Toyota FTHS, but nothing ever came of it. Then in 2010, Toyota filed a patent for the Supra name and we all freaked out. Any patent freak knows that once a patent is filed for a name, a product has to be developed within three years for them to use that name. That's patent freak 101. So this was a good sign for Supra fans. But then we got the FRS. The FRS is cool, but don't get me wrong. It's got 200 horsepower, it's not a Supra. The trademark patent expired. And for a minute, it seemed like the Supra was going to be eternally breaking rocks in hell for literally no reason at all. What are they doing with these rock crumbles? Do they make them into cement? Is that how cement is really made? I don't know. What I do know is that in 2018, Toyota finally teased the new A90 Supra. But just like Jesus, when it came back, it had a German accent. That was because the A90 had been developed jointly with BMW. A lot of people were critical of it when it came out because it shared a platform with the Z4 and it didn't come with a manual. But now that it's been on the market for a few years, there's a lot, a lot of aftermarket support. And the people who actually drive them seem to really like them. I would 100% drive a new Supra. And it is a bummer that it doesn't have a manual, but if we stopped liking cars that didn't have manual transmissions, pretty soon there wouldn't be very many cars left to light. So for those reasons, the Supra gets to stay out of hell. Let me know what cars you guys want me to send to hell. Hit that subscribe button so we know we're doing a good job and so you don't miss any uh, donut media content. We have a video almost every day. If you wanna learn about more cars that are in hell, check out this video. Uh, if you wanna buy yourself a shirt or a hat or a lanyard, go to donutmedia.com and follow me on all social platforms at James Pumphrey. I love you.